this experience for me made me realize more about myself than what than what I knew. Um, and I think sometimes that happens. People always say, you don't know how you're going to react until you're in the situation. And it's true. I Thank you so much for meeting with me today. It's so fun to see you. So people don't know that we go way back. We were friends in college. Yes. That was a long time ago. I know. <laughs> we still think we're young, but I don't want to say how many years that's been. I know. I forget until I wake up in the morning and see myself. <laughs> or until somebody's like, my kid's getting married, or I'm a grandma, and I'm thinking, what? I went to, you know, college or high school with that person, and then I think, oh, I guess we are that old to biologically be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's kind of crazy. So introduce yourself a little bit to everybody. Um, your name, interests, hobbies, work, kind of a little bit about you. I'm Emily Mannion, and I'm Basically, I just say that I'm just a mom and sometimes people um, want to correct me, um, but that's that's really, I feel who I am. I, I went to college and went into human behavior and ended up being a social worker. I loved that until I got married and had kids. Um, and I focused a lot of just being a stay at home, I homeschool my kids. Um, and that's been my biggest, my biggest hobby. Um, and then I recently went back to work uh, at a foster family agency and I don't get to be a social worker, but um, I work in the quality assurance department. And so I feel like I'm uh, giving back a little bit now that I have, now that my kids are a little older and can stand to have me away once in a while. I mostly work at home, um, but giving back to the community, working with the kids um, on, a, on a different scale, but uh, I've enjoyed that. So that's basically really, all there is about me. That's great. That's awesome. So today we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to go back to your third pregnancy and you're going to take us back to that time and kind of explain. Um, we don't want to go to the very beginning of that pregnancy, <laughs> maybe more when you <laughs> <Day found one. laughs> out, when you out and as things unfolded through that pregnancy, will you share a little bit about that? Yes. Okay. So I want to first preface that this is my experience and my opinions come from my experience. And I think that this topic is a really touchy topic and it causes a lot of anger on both sides. And that's not my intent when I share this story. It's really to uh, share, to inform and maybe empower somebody that's going through any type of decision in their life, not just focused on this particular story that I'm sharing. Um, and it's also not to shame or make anybody feel guilty in the past for making different choices. I think we're all on our own journey. Um, we all have our own, oh, I didn't know I was gonna get emotional. Um, we all have our own experiences. And um, this experience for me made me realize more about myself than what, than what I knew. Um, and I think sometimes that happens. People always say, you don't know how you're going to react until you're in the situation. And it's true. I, I think that I can be black and white my whole entire life until I'm faced with the decision. And, and then that's the true test of um, your character and, and how you get through things. So um, like you said, it was my third pregnancy. She, uh, I was tired. I had two others. Um, my, my second born was only a year uh, less than a year. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want to go into the, the doctor's office uh, when I found out. I had done it before. Um, it's pretty much autopilot. I didn't need to take the blood test. I didn't need to be told I was healthy. I didn't, I didn't really, it wasn't, and it wasn't that I wasn't excited. I was, I was super excited. Um, I was tired and I was homeschooling my, then she was six and I had a, a baby still. So, and in my mind, it didn't make any difference what the outcome was anyway. So why get the blood test? Why do everything? I think I was considered mature at that time. I think I was uh, close to 35, if not 35. So um, I was, what do they call it? Mature or, or matronly or I don't know, <laughs> geriatrics. I don't know. I was something where they, they were like, oh, you need to do the, you know, these tests. Right. Right. So I was like, whatever. Um, and when I, when I grew up, I, as you know, I grew up in a, um, a loving, uh, organized religion. 
Um, but in my early 20s, I stopped going, but I think I had some core values from, from, in, from being in that environment. And so my process of, I'm not, those outcomes don't matter to me. I'm going to have the baby no matter what was just what it was for me. Um, so I went in for my 20 week ultrasound. We wanted to know at that time um, if it was going to be a boy um, because my husband has um, had had three girls from a previous marriage and then two more with me. And so we're thinking that there's no way it could be a sixth girl. Um, and we learned that it was a girl. And again, because she was my third, I just realized something was off in the ultrasound. Uh, she acted different. It was just a different experience. So I went home and I said, you know, there's something, there's something wrong with her. Um, I don't know what it is. She was the technician. She said the doctor would call me, but it's not, it's not the same as the other two. Um, he didn't go with me. He was busy. He took, I, I had set up a field trip for the girls. Um, I didn't want him with me at that time because I didn't want him to be disappointed if he found out <laughs> it was a girl. So I said, you go play with the other two. I'll give you a call, but you know. So when I came home, that's why I was explaining to him that it wasn't a normal ultrasound. Um, so then a week later, I got a call from my doctor and she let me know that there were markers for Down syndrome um, and that I needed to go in for some further tests. So at this point, um, when I made the appointment with the specialist, it was 22 weeks. Um, so we go in and we first talked to the counselor. We hadn't talked to the specialist. Um, we hadn't seen an ultrasound. Uh, they hadn't done more tests or studies to see if that's in fact what it was. And um, they offered me to terminate the pregnancy. And I was a little surprised at the time because I was, I was 22 weeks and I thought that le legally um, it had to be any time 20 weeks or earlier. And so when I asked why they offered that to me, they said that if it's a medical condition, you can choose up to the day of. Um, this was 2000, she was born in 2012. I'm trying to think the timeline. I don't know if it was still 2011, but 2000, end of 2011, beginning of 2012 when, when we were experiencing this. So up to the day of, the day of uh, birth, I was able to choose because um, she had a medical condition. So um, there I was, I was sitting in a situation that I thought that instantly I would say, no way, I don't care, it doesn't matter. Um, this is my baby. And when that was offered to me, choices went through my head and, um, and I considered it. And I think that that's something that Again, we can't, we can't judge unless we're in a situation and uh, depending on our mental well-being, um, depending on our situation, um, we are faced with decisions we never thought we would have to make and we react differently than what we think we're going to. And um, so they brought me into the room and we, they showed up the ultrasound and after some tests, we were there for a while. Um, they said that it didn't look like that she had Down syndrome, but um, that she may be missing some organs and that she potentially had a growth on uh, her lung that could be cancerous. And uh, I cried and the nurse held me. And later I found out that nurse had to leave and take a break. Um, my neighbor was there with her own appointment and the nurse went into her room and broke down and said that she was sorry, but that she was dealing with another patient that was going through a hard time. And we didn't know that until after we had got home and we were talking about our appointments and she's like, oh my gosh, that was you. I didn't know. Um, so, so things went from, is she going to even be sustainable when I gave birth to her? And um, so some of the, the thoughts that went through my head was, was my marriage strong enough to deal with potential loss? Or um, was it strong enough to deal with special needs? Did I have money to provide what that baby needed? Um, 
was this going to affect the lives of my children? And um, when they brought her up and I saw her, I, I named her right then. And I knew that she was meant for me. Um, and if you, if you met her now, you would realize it, it almost seemed to me at the time that she was waving at us saying, you guys, you guys, I'm here. Um, and if you met her, you would know her personality that, that maybe, maybe some of my hormones or my doubt or whatever seeped in my placenta and she, she absorbed it. I don't know, but she's, she's a firecracker. Um, and so we went home and we decided that this this was our baby regardless of, of the outcome. And um, I, I emailed people that were in my life and that I trusted loved me. And I shared my story and it was with you, Angie. Um, and you, I don't know if it's okay for me to say or if you wanna edit it out, it's fine. But um, you shared with me about your son who um, is special needs and how one of your biggest pet peeves is when people say, oh, it doesn't matter if it's a boy or girl, as long as they're healthy. And that was that was one of you, something that made you annoyed or, or hurt you because all of them are perfect. Um, all of them have um, gifts to give. And it doesn't matter if, you know, they have their special needs or if they live for a second or you, get to hold them and they um, were born silent. Um, they have they have a gift to give. And it doesn't matter if they're healthy or not, they're yours. And oh, I want to go back. Um, when I was in the when I was in the office, they were super nice and thought they were being super supportive and um offering to terminate the pregnancy. And it was brought up even after the counseling session that we went in. And later I was able to reflect how I feel like by them being that supportive, I know that, that they were coming from a good heart, but it wasn't necessarily the support I needed. It was a, hey, you have a problem, let's fix it, let's forget it, let's move on. Rather than you're a strong person, um, you can handle this. We know people who have made the choice to go ahead and move forward and they ended up being fine. So I think that an awareness of um, wanting to make me feel comfortable um, also made me feel a little not, not empowered because I felt like maybe I was incapable of moving forward. And so I know people need different things at different times, but my personality, I kind of wanted to be told I was a rock star and that this was just a part of, of my life and my journey and that it would be okay even if it wasn't okay. You just, you just, you, you experience and that's what life is. Um, so she was born. Um, so we went through we went through this our whole in pregnancy. There were lots of different diagnoses, and um, they were able to find the organs that she needed. Uh, that she um, they, she didn't have a tumor, uh, but she had a condition called CCAM. I don't even remember what that entails anymore. Uh, they didn't know if she'd be able to breathe on her own when she was born, and if maybe she'd have to go to um, the NICU. But she was born three weeks early, a little over eight pounds. So remember, I still had a choice at that time. I could have changed the at the day before it, um, to terminate, and she was an eight-pound baby, um, and she was breathing on her own. But they went ahead and took precautions and took her to NICU, where she remained for two weeks. Um, and after several CT scans and um, doctors looking at her, uh, they changed her diagnosis to infantile emphysema. Um, she's non-symptomatic, and uh, they talked about removing one of her lungs, but it's completely in, um, infected that they don't want to, uh, if, since she's non-symptomatic, they don't feel the need to put her through the trauma of, of doing the surgery. But that was only after about five CT scans that they did on her that they came to that conclusion. 
And, uh, and again, I just, I, we're lucky, we're lucky that uh, she's, that she's fine and viable, but I do remember your words, Angie, of, of even if she wasn't, it's okay. That's, that's their, that's their experience. Um, and it's their gift to give to me. And, um, and I guess that's our story. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember even saying that, but I want to know a little bit, I kind of wrapped up the, the whole story, but emotionally, this was kind of exhausting. I, you were so worried. You didn't know what to expect. I mean, looking back now, you know that he's fine, but you didn't know that. And I want to know a little bit more about how you handled that emotionally, how you maybe coped, even maybe, I don't know if you had sleepless nights or times when you were just really worried, how would this impact my family? How did you move through that? Um, I feel like the, the burden of all of those feelings were all in that, that moment at, in the office. And as soon as I realized that this was mine, whether it ended up good or, or bad, it was, it was my experiences to be had that we went home and we just figured it would, sorry, my dog's working. It would just be, it, it is what it is. And we had so many people um, support us from our circle that, and they weren't offended. Um, you know, we had people who were like, well, I have a kid that has special needs or I have a kid with Down syndromes and, and they helped us. They helped us with resources and we just prepared that if this was going to be what what we are, you know, we could prepare ourselves for. Um, some of those, some of those diagnoses were ruled out after other tests. So then we moved on to the next. Um, before she was, right before she was born, it was CCAM. So it was potential she would need surgery right when she was born. Um, depending on how severe it was, they wouldn't know until she was born. And, um, and then fortunately for us, she didn't need the surgery. So we didn't have to worry about that right when she was born. She seemed like a, a healthy baby. Our, our hardest trial was just being separated from her for two weeks. And that story is almost uh, incomparable to what other people deal with. So we just, we just felt lucky that we were bracing ourselves for um, potential surgery or her not being able to breathe on her own. And when she was, um, we just felt happy to move forward. So how old is she now? She's eight. She's eight. And how is her health now? Her health is fine. Um, the, the, there was one time that in one of her visits, the doctor said she would never, she'd never be the fastest runner because she is, um, she's uh, operating on one lung. Um, and she heard that and then she started practicing running. She's a competitive dancer. She doesn't seem to have any pain. She doesn't really know how to answer that question because if she's born with it, she may have pain that she's not, that it's, that's normal to her. So she wouldn't know. Um, we take uh, any type of sickness pretty seriously to see what her breathing patterns are and if she needs to go in. Um, she's had pneumonia once and the, the hospital takes really good care of her. They admit her, um, they take her condition very seriously, but it's never been, um, it's never been serious. They, they just make sure that they're ruling out, um, any potential hazards and, and usually she ends up fine. She's actually probably the healthiest, the healthiest one out of the three. She doesn't seem to ever get sick. There was about, about one time that I remember, and then maybe minor colds, but she recovers pretty quickly. So um, as I recall, the birth, even the approaching the birth, they were very worried and it was going to be kind of a bigger ordeal. They were going to schedule a cesarean and yes. take the baby. <laughs> and, okay, it's going to be a kind of a big thing. And, yeah. and I'd like you to share a little bit about how her birth unfolded. Yeah, you have a good memory. Um, yeah, she, we had the cesarean scheduled for um, the week, exactly seven days after the day that I had her. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started, I, I was on bed rest. Oh, gosh, it, it's all coming back. Um, I was on bed rest for, because she was starting to come and I was getting a, a contractions about six weeks early. And they said, we will admit you and keep you here at the office. But if you have support at home, we'll let you go home. 
So I went home and I had friends, sister-in-laws, um, people coming in to help pick up Mackenzie and put her into her crib for nap time because I wasn't able to pick up heavy things. Um, my husband stopped traveling um, and we just we just kept it really easy. I, I, I slept a lot, um, laid in my bed, watched, or uh, I guess Netflix wasn't around then, so I must have just been reading. Um, <laughs> and then we do before Netflix. <laughs> Uh, the contractions were happening and they were happening quickly. Um, and we called up my sister-in-law. She came to the house uh, within, it took her seven minutes to get to our house. And he bolted down. This was in the middle of the night. I think, um, I don't know, I can't remember, two, three in the morning. And he bolted down the freeway. Um, and I was, I was, I knew I was having her. Um, we got into the hospital. I asked for drugs. They um, they were like, okay, we'll get you situated. And when they checked me out, they realized that it was it was too late for anything. And so I was super nervous. I was screaming. I was not at my best. Um, I had no pride. Um, I was not reserved. And I was saying that you know it was supposed to be a cesarean. And so they they hurried up and scrubbed my husband in so that he could be a part of it. And they were, they had the team in there, but they kept on telling me, you just have to, you just have to let her out. And um, I was saying, I would, I would do it. I would do it. So she, Reagan, my daughter, she birthed herself. She, she, it was like you walking through a door. That's what she did. I refused to give birth to her without a cesarean because I, the plan was the cesarean and that they were going to whisk her away and make sure that she was fine. And I was worried, you know, we don't like change. And I mentally prep of this is what I'm going to deal with in my life. And it, it changed on me. Um, and uh, anyway, she was born and my recovery from her was better than the first two. Um, she was in perfect position. The other two were sunny side up and I, and I was on epidural and everything. This one was just all natural, not my choice. I'm not like a rock star, um, you know, person that is not afraid of pain or anything. I, it all happened all by accident. And, um, and she was born and she cried and I got to hold her and, and then they took her from me, oh. but then I got her back. <laughs> but what did you think when, when you heard her cry? Mm, I, it was, it was, it was great. The meant she was, you know, she got air and she could breathe on her own. And she was, she was fine. She was my only one. I don't even think she had jaundice. I mean, she was pretty, pretty fantastic, but Again, you know, some people aren't, aren't, um, I don't want to say fortunate because I want to, I don't want to sound like again, if those things happen to them that they're not fortunate, but I don't want to necessarily focus on how great she was because it seems like an end of the story of thank, thank goodness I didn't choose to terminate because she ended up being perfect. Mm -hmm. I really want to focus on that. I came to one, I came to a point where I actually considered it when I never thought that I would. And so I learned something about myself. And two, I realized that whatever came my way were my experiences to be had. And had it turned out differently, yes, it would have been heart wrenching, and maybe I wouldn't have been able to recover, and maybe our marriage wouldn't have lasted, or you know, maybe I would have had to been on medications and institutionalized for a while until I could function. I don't know, but that would have been my journey, and that would have been something um, that. Uh, maybe I could have inspired other people who have had loss, um, like like you do, Angie. You're the one. You told me they're all perfect, and and they are. They're all perfect. I love that you accepted whatever was to come. That's not a, an easy thing. And you were, you said this could be very difficult, but it's mine, and you took it on. And you know, you say, yeah, I'm lucky or blessed that this didn't have a different outcome, but I love that you were willing, you were willing to take it. So I wanna ask a couple more things. Um, looking back, it sounds like you've learned a lot. I was gonna ask you what you've learned, but what do you feel the blessings have been from this experience? Um, I think mainly that, that um, I've, been able to become more compassionate and understanding that everybody has their own path and their own struggles and their own reasonings for doing things and judgment doesn't have a place mm -hmm. 
for anybody on any side. Yeah. And um, I learned about myself that I can't say, oh, I would never consider or I would never do. And, and now that I've passed this particular incident, this learn, um, this lesson applies to everything. Oh, I would never, you know, I would never let my kid drive at 16 or whatever. That's a dumb example. But, and then all of a sudden you're in a situation where you're considering it. And so judgment doesn't have a place. I feel like I love more. I feel like I'm a better person, um, not just because of Reagan, but just because I get to be a mom and I, I have had lots of different experiences that have, um, helped me um just just want to embrace people and help that's great i love i love how you keep emphasizing no judging because i remember before i had kids like everything was going to be perfect kids were going to be perfect because I was going to teach them and everything was going to be wonderful <laughs> but it sure is eye-opening isn't it as we grow and parent that um, we don't necessarily know everything that we think we know or that we would do everything the way we think right. we're we huge experts before we have kids and then we realize we don't know anything <laughs> it's so true These kids are really humbling aren't they <laughs> <laughs> They help us uh, grow a lot. Yes, and Reagan, Reagan's my my um, my strongest critic. She was looking at me really closely one morning. She's the one who wakes me up in the morning, um, and and I love it. She's my cuddler. She's the one who she she's a pistol, but she um, she also has this this nurturing cuddle hugs that the other two have grown out of, and she just keeps on going. But she was looking at me really close and she started touching my eyebrows and she's like, mommy, you're losing hair where it needs to be, but it's growing other places. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> so, so when you say they're humbling, I mean, they pick out your flaws, but they love you anyway. <laughs> yeah. My littlest was snuggling with me and I thought we were having such a sweet moment. And she looked up at me and she said, mom, you're you have a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're growing hair where it's not supposed to be. We're losing it everywhere else. But <laughs> I know. I was all feeling these little feelings. Yeah, these moments of, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> oh, that's fun. So do you have anything else you'd like to add to? I just hope that this message um, is really, again, you said I have emphasis, the non-judgment on either side, because that's not what it's meant for. And I don't want people closed off based on it because they don't agree with, with what I'm saying or what I'm promoting. Um, I want it to just be an overall, when we are faced with roadblocks, an overall, who are we? Who are we deep down? Um, how will this affect us in the long term? what is our situation what is our support and then move on from there and not not be um not be intense to each other on either side or not try to convince somebody just share share with love share the experience and hope and um i guess that would just be my message 